So I've had the great privilege of traveling to some incredible places, photographing these distant landscapes and remote cultures all over the world. I love my job. But people think it's the string of epiphanies and sunrises and rainbows, when in reality it looks more something like this. <laughs> right? This is my office. And we can't afford the fanciest places to stay at night, so we tend to sleep a lot outdoors. Uh, as long as we can stay dry, that's a bonus. And we also can't afford the fanciest restaurants, so we tend to eat whatever is on the local menu. And if you're in the Ecuadorian Paramo, you're going to eat a large rodent called a cuy. <laughs> <laughs> but what makes our experiences perhaps a little bit different and a little more unique than that of the average person is that we have this gnawing thing in the back of our mind that even in our darkest moments, in those times of despair, we think, hey, there might be a, an image to be made here. There might be a story to be told. And why is storytelling important? Well, it helps us to connect with our cultural and our natural heritage. And in the Southeast, there's an alarming disconnect between the public and the natural areas that allow us to be here in the first place. You see, we're visual creatures, so we use what we see to teach us what we know. Now, the majority of us aren't going to willingly go wade out into a swamp, right? So how can we still expect those same people to then advocate on behalf of their protection? We can't. So my job then is to use photography as a communication tool to help bridge the gap between the science and the aesthetics, to get people talking, to get them thinking, and to hopefully, ultimately, get them caring. Now, I started doing this 15 years ago, right here in Gainesville, right here in my backyard. And I fell in love with adventure and discovery, going to explore all these different places that were just minutes from my front doorstep. There's a lot of beautiful places to find. Despite all these years that have passed, I still see the world through the eyes of a child, and I try to incorporate that sense of wonderment and that sense of curiosity into my photography as often as I can. And we're pretty lucky because here in the South, we're still blessed with a relatively blank canvas that we can fill with the most fanciful adventures and incredible experiences. It's just a, a matter of how far our imagination will take us. See, a lot of people look at this and they say, oh yeah, wow, okay, that's a pretty tree. But I don't just see a tree. I look at this and I see opportunity. I see an entire weekend. Because when I was a kid, these are the types of images that got me off the sofa and dared me to explore, dared me to go find the woods and put my head underwater and see what we have. And folks, I've been photographing all over the world, and I promise you what we have here in the South, what we have here in the Sunshine State rivals anything else that I've seen. But yet our tourism industry is busy promoting all the wrong things. Before most kids are 12, they'll have been to Disney World more times than they've been in a canoe or camping under a starry sky. And I have nothing against Disney or Mickey. I used to go there too. But they're missing out on those fundamental connections that create a real sense of pride and, and ownership for the place that they call home. And this is compounded by the issue that the landscapes that define our natural heritage and fuel our aquifer for our drinking water have been deemed as scary and dangerous and spooky. See, when our ancestors first came here, they were warned, stay out of these areas. They're haunted. They're full of evil spirits and ghosts. I don't know where they came up with that idea. But it's actually led to a very real disconnect, a very real negative mentality that has kept the public disinterested, silent, and ultimately our environment at risk. You see, we're a state that's surrounded and defined by water, and yet for centuries, swamps and wetlands have been regarded as these obstacles to overcome. And so we've treated them as these second-class ecosystems because they have very little monetary value, and of course, they're known to harbor alligators and snakes, which I'll admit, you know, these aren't the most cuddly of ambassadors. <laughs> so it became assumed then that the only good swamp was a drain swamp. And in fact, draining a swamp to make way for agriculture and development was considered the very essence of conservation not too long ago. 
But now we're backpedaling because the more we come to learn about these sodden landscapes, the more secrets we're starting to unlock about interspecies relationships and the connectivity of habitats, watersheds, and flyways. Now take this bird, for example. This is the prothonotary warbler. I love this bird because it's a swamp bird, through and through, a swamp bird. They nest and they mate and they breed in these old growth swamps in these flooded forests. And so after the spring, after they raise their young, they then fly thousands of miles over the Gulf of Mexico into Central and South America. And then after the winter, the spring rolls around and then they come back. They fly thousands of miles over the Gulf of Mexico. And where do they go? Where do they land? Right back in the same tree. That's nuts. This is a bird the size of a tennis ball. I mean, that's crazy. I use a GPS to get here today, and this is my hometown, right? <laughs> so that's, that's crazy. But so what happens then when this bird flies over the Gulf of Mexico into Central America for the winter, and then the spring rolls around and it flies back, and it comes back to this, a freshly sodded golf course. You know, this is a narrative that's all too commonly unraveling here in this state. And this is a natural process that's occurred for thousands of years, and we're just now learning about it. So you can imagine all else we have to learn about these landscapes if we just preserve them first. Now, despite all this rich life that abounds in these swamps, they still have a bad name. Many people feel uncomfortable with the idea of wading into Florida's black water. I can understand that. But what is what I loved about growing up in the Sunshine State is that for so many of us, we live with this latent but very palpable fear that when we put our toes into the water, there might be something much more ancient and much more adapted than we are. Knowing that you're not top dog is a welcome discomfort, I think. I mean, how often in this modern and urban and digital age do you actually get the chance to feel vulnerable? Or consider that the world may not have been made for just us. So for the last decade, I began seeking out these areas where the concrete yields to forests and the pines turn to cypress. And I viewed all these mosquitoes and reptiles, all these discomforts, as affirmations that I'd found true wilderness. And I embraced them wholly. Now, as a conservation photographer obsessed with black water, it was only fitting that I'd eventually end up in the most famous swamp of all the Everglades. Because growing up here in north central Florida, it always had these enchanted names, places like Loxahatchee and Fackahatchee, Corkscrew, Big Cypress. I started what then turned into a five-year project to hopefully reintroduce the Everglades in a new light, in a more inspired light. But I knew this was going to be a tall order because here you have an area that's roughly a third the size of the state of Florida. It's huge. And when I say Everglades, most people are like, oh yeah, yeah, the National Park. The Everglades is not just a park, it's an entire watershed. Entire watershed, it's starting with the Kissimmee chain of lakes in the north, and then as the rains would fall in the summer, these downpours, it would flow into Lake Okeechobee, and Lake Okeechobee would fill up and then it'd overflow its banks, and it'd spill southward ever slowly with the topography, and go into the river of grass, the sawgrass prairies, before meeting into the cypress sloughs, until going further south into the mangrove swamps, and then finally, finally reaching Florida Bay. The Emerald Gem of the Everglades, the great estuary, 850 square mile estuary. So sure, the, the National Park is the southern end of this system, but all the things that make it unique are these inputs that come in, the fresh water that starts 100 miles north. So no manner of these political or, or invisible boundaries protect the park from polluted water or insufficient water. And unfortunately, that's precisely what we've done. Over the last 60 years, we have drained, we have dammed, we have dredged the Everglades to where now only one-third of the water that used to reach the bay now reaches the bay today. And so this story is not all sunshine and rainbows, unfortunately. For better or for worse, the, the story of the Everglades is, is intrinsically tied to the peaks and the valleys of mankind's relationship with the natural world. But I'll show you these beautiful pictures because it gets you on board. And while I have your attention, I can tell you the real story is that we're taking this and we're trading it for this at an alarming rate. And what's lost on so many people is the sheer scale of which we're discussing. 
because the Everglades is not just responsible for the drinking water for 7 million Floridians. Today, it also provides agricultural fields for the year-round tomatoes and oranges for over 300 million Americans. And it's that same seasonal pulse of water in, in the summer that built the river of grass 6,000 years ago. Ironically, today is also responsible for the over half a million acres of the endless river of sugarcane. These same fields that are responsible for dumping exceedingly high levels of fertilizers into the watershed, forever changing the system. But in order for you guys not to just understand how this system works, but to also get personally connected to it, I decided to break this story down into several different narratives. And I wanted that story to start in Lake Okeechobee, the beating heart of the Everglades system. And to do that, I, I picked an ambassador, an iconic species. And this is the Everglades snail kite. It's a great bird. And they used to nest in the thousands, thousands in the northern Everglades. And then they've gone down to around 400 nesting pairs today. And why is that? Well, it's because they eat one source of food, an apple snail, about the size of a ping pong ball, an aquatic gastropod. And so as we started damming up uh, the Everglades, as we started diking Lake Okeechobee and draining the wetlands, we lost the habitat for the snail. And thus the population of the kites declined. And so I wanted a photo that would not only communicate this relationship between wetland, snail, and bird, but I also wanted a photo that would communicate how, how incredible this relationship was and how very important it is that they've come to depend on each other, this healthy wetland and this bird. And to do that, I brainstormed this idea. I started sketching out these, uh, these plans to make a photo, and I sent it to the wildlife biologist down in Okeechobee. And this is an endangered bird, so it takes special permission to do. And so I built this submerged platform that would hold snails just right under the water, and I spent months planning this uh, this. this crazy idea. And I took this platform down to Lake Okeechobee and I spent over a week in the water waiting waist deep from nine hour shifts from dawn until dusk to get the one image that I thought might communicate this. And here's the, the day that it finally worked. After setting up the platform, I look off and I see a kite coming over the cattails. And I see him scanning and searching. And he gets right over the trap. And I see that he's eating. And he beelines. He goes straight for the trap. And in that moment, all those months of planning, waiting, all the sunburns, mosquito bites, suddenly they're all worth it. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can't believe it. Uh, you can believe how excited I was when that happened. But what the idea was is that for someone who's never seen this bird and has no reason to care about it, the idea is that these photos, these new perspectives, will help shed a little new light on just one species that makes this watershed so incredible, so valuable, so important. Now, I know I, I can't come here to Gainesville and talk to you about animals at the Everglades without talking about gators. I love gators. I grew up loving gators. My parents always said I had an unhealthy relationship with gators. But what I like about them is that they're like the freshwater equivalent to sharks. They are feared, they're hated, and they are tragically misunderstood. Because these are a unique species. They're not just apex predators. In the Everglades, they are the very architects of the Everglades. Because as the water drops down in the winter during the dry season, they start excavating these holes called gator holes. And they do this because as the water drops down, they'll be able to stay wet and they'll be able to forage. And now this isn't just affecting them. Other animals also depend on this relationship. So they become a keystone species as well. So how do you make an apex predator, an ancient reptile, at once look like it dominates the system, but at the same time look vulnerable? Well, you wade into a pit of about 120 of them, and you hope that you've made the right decision. <laughs> Still have all my fingers, it's cool. <laughs> but I understand, I know I'm not gonna rally you guys, I'm not gonna rally the troops to save the Everglades for the gators. It won't happen because they're so ubiquitous. We see them now, they're one of the great conservation success stories of the US. But there is one species in the Glades that no matter who you are, you can't help but love to, and that's the roseate spoonbill. These birds are great. And they've had a really tough time in the Everglades because they started out with thousands of nesting pairs in Florida Bay. And at the turn of the 20th century, they got down to two. Two nesting pairs. And why? That's because women thought they looked better on their hats than they did flying in the sky. But then we banned the plume trade. We banned it. 
and their numbers started rebounding. And as their numbers started rebounding, scientists began to pay attention. They started studying these birds. And what they found out is that these birds' behavior is intrinsically tied to the annual drawdown cycle of water in the Everglades, the thing that defines the Everglades' watershed. And what they found out is that these birds started nesting in the winter as the water drew down because they're tactile feeders, so they have to touch whatever they eat. And so they wait for these concentrated pools of fish to be able to feed enough to feed their young. So these birds became the very icon of the Everglades, an indicator species of the overall health of the system. And just as their numbers were rebounding in the mid-20th century, shooting up, you know, to 900, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, just as that started happening, we started draining the southern Everglades. And we stopped two-thirds of that water from moving south. And it had drastic consequences. And just as those numbers started reaching their peak, unfortunately today, the real spoonbill story, the real photo of what it looks like is more something like this. That we're down to less than 70 nesting pairs in Florida Bay today because we've disrupted the system so much. And so all these different organizations are, are shouting, they're screaming, they're, oh, the Everglades is fragile, it's fragile. It is not. It is resilient. Because despite all we've taken, despite all we've done and we've drained and we've dammed and we've dredged it, pieces of it are still here waiting to be put back together. And this is what I loved about South Florida is that in one place you have this unstoppable force of mankind meeting the immovable object of tropical nature. And it's at this frontier that we are forced with a new appraisal. What is wilderness worth? What is the value of biodiversity or our drinking water? And fortunately, after decades of debate, we're finally starting to act on those questions. We're slowly undertaking these projects to bring more fresh water back to the bay. But it's up to us as citizens, as residents, as stewards to hold our elected officials to their promises. And what can you do to help? It's so easy. Just get outside. Get out there. Take your friends out. Take your kids out. Take your family out. Hire a fishing guide. Show the state that protecting wilderness not only makes ecological sense, but economic sense as well. It's a lot of fun. Just do it. Put your feet in the water. The swamp will change you, I promise. You know, over the years, we've been so generous with these other landscapes around the country, cloaking them with this American pride, places that we now consider define us. Grand Canyon, Yosemite, Yellowstone. And we use these parks and these natural areas as these beacons and as cultural compasses. And sadly, the Everglades is very commonly left out of that conversation. But I believe it's every bit as iconic and emblematic of who we are as a country as any of these other wildernesses. It's just a different kind of wild. But I'm encouraged because maybe we're finally starting to come around. Because what was once deemed this swampy wasteland today is a World Heritage Site. It's a wetland of international importance. And we've come a long way in the last 60 years. And as the world's largest and most ambitious wetland restoration project, the international spotlight is on us in the Sunshine State. Because if we can heal this system, it's going to become an icon for wetland restoration all over the world. But it's up to us to decide which legacy we want to attach our flag to. Now, they say that the Everglades is our greatest test. If we pass it, we get to keep the planet. I love that quote because it's a challenge. It's a prod. Can we do it? Will we do it? We have to. We must. But the Everglades is not just a test. It's also a gift and ultimately our responsibility. Thank you.